None of the scriptures that I'll be reading from today will be up on the uh, screen there, so I'll try to give you an advance warning. You can look them up if you want to follow along. The question I start off asking is, do you ever stereotype people? If you answer honestly, your answer is yes. We all do it. It is human nature to do so. Whether it's due to race, religion, lifestyle, political affiliation, or any other reason, it's human nature to look at other people, to see the differences, and then to form opinions based on those differences. That is stereotyping. On the negative end of that scale, it's called prejudice. As Christians, I said it was human nature that we have this. As Christians, we should never let our human nature supersede our spiritual nature. Our spiritual nature should always take precedence. So if you want to turn to Matthew chapter 5, Jesus speaks to this. Matthew chapter 5, verses 44 through 48. He gives us the way we are supposed to behave. Jesus' words say, But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? If you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, if you were reading from the King James Version, instead of tax collectors, you would have seen the word publican. Publicans in biblical times were those who collected taxes. And have you ever considered how many times the words or the phrase tax collectors is used or mentioned in the Bible, especially during Jesus' ministry. I mean, it's, it is a very commonly reoccurring theme. And although it may seem in contradiction to the words that Jesus spoke in Matthew, Jesus repeatedly singles out the tax collectors as references for their dishonesty and their reputation for being dishonorable people. They appear to be a certain standard of bad. Tax collecting did not make them bad. They were not people, bad people because of being a tax collector. They were bad because, or seen as bad, is because they were tax collecting for Rome. And Rome was occupying the Jews. Rome had taken over Jerusalem, and they were being heavily taxed. And so the tax collectors worked for the Roman government. And in addition to collecting taxes for the Roman government, they were allowed to collect a fee for themselves. And so most of the tax collectors were collecting extra and doing so dishonestly. So they were seen as kind of taking, not only robbing from the people, but also doing it on behalf of an evil group of people. And this is why they had the reputation for being dishonest. And it's also the reason why the words tax collector are so often associated with the word sinner. The two groups are often mentioned together, and there's an implication that they're equally bad, but different. It's kind of like, All tax collectors were sinners, but not all sinners were tax collectors, if you follow the idea. There's multiple verses mentioning that. You want to turn to Matthew chapter 9. Multiple verses mentioning tax collectors and sinners, and they're noted over multiple Gospels. Matthew chapter 9, verses 10 and 11. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Now, there's the same account in Mark. If you look at Mark chapter 2, while, this is in verse 15, Mark 2, 15 and 16. Same account, while Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who had followed him. And when the teachers of the law, who were the Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and the tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And there's even the same account given in Luke chapter 5, verses 29 and 30. Then Levi had a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, who belonged to their sect, complained to the disciples, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners. 
And then finally in Luke 15, I have one, Luke 15, one and two. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered together to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So it's clearly evident by these verses how the tax collectors were viewed. There's no question about that. They were despised for being dishonest. And it even appears that Jesus, in his statements, almost stereotypes these same people. So if you want to go back to Matthew, Matthew chapter 18, Jesus references them again here. This is in verses 15 through 17 of Matthew 18. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault, just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they listen not, take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Then if they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church, and if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. And this almost seems that he's contradicting what he says about how we're supposed to treat people. He's not. I want you to understand that. It seems like he's condoning people to have contempt for the tax collectors, but he's just pointing them out as people who had acted badly. And indeed, Jesus does reference the tax collectors in other times, and we'll see other accounts that the tax collectors are not necessarily bad people. And I want to preface this. I'm not saying this because tax season is coming up. <laughs> I don't want you to think that's where this is headed. So this is in Matthew chapter 21, verses 31 and 32. After telling the parable of the two sons, in Matthew 21, and, uh, verses 31 and 32, Jesus stated the following. Which of the two did his father... Uh, did what his father wanted. The first they answered, and Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. So Jesus here points out that tax collectors and even prostitutes were becoming believers. And we're all familiar with Luke chapter 18 with a very famous parable regarding a tax collector. This is one you probably don't even have to look up to know what I'm going to be talking about. This is Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14, and it is the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Note to whom he's speaking. To some who were confident in their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else. Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven. But he beat his chest and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you, this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted." Here, Jesus uses an example of a tax collector in the same way he used the Good Samaritan. If you know the parable of the Good Samaritan. He used that to, point, to point, make a point about uh, contrasting true righteousness to self-righteousness. Jesus did this to teach the Pharisees, the lawyers, and those who were uh, claiming to be the righteous ones that someone that they may not expect can be righteous. And he used the the good Samaritan, or use the Samaritan in the story the same way you use the tax collectors because they were hated among those people. And he did it to show the hatred that the Jews had in their hearts toward these people. And again, he used someone who was viewed mostly as a sinner. This would have been a real slap in the face to the Pharisees. I mean, very much so. 
because they saw themselves as the ultimate religious authority at the time. And they were the, who, who, uh, the ones who were kept, considered to be the true keepers of, of the faith. And yet we know that the Pharisees and the laws, uh, the Pharisees and the keepers of the law rejected not only Jesus, but they also rejected John the Baptist before, as Jesus had referenced earlier, but also in Luke, you look in Luke 3.12, it says, even the tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? And in Luke 7, verses 29 through 30, all the people, even the tax collectors, when they heard Jesus' words, acknowledged that God's way was right because he, they had been baptized by John. But the Pharisees and the experts in the law rejected God's purpose for them because they had not been baptized by John. So you see in this verse that even the tax collectors were willing to receive the message of repentance that was preached by John. And we know that Jesus called Matthew, who was a tax collector, and he followed him. And the scriptures show us that tax collectors and the sinners can certainly be reached and be changed. And this is vitally important for me to stress that the change that takes place comes by way of the Holy Spirit. After all, the scripture states that no man can call Jesus except by the Holy Spirit. And hearing about and having contact with Jesus then changes their life. And indeed, Jesus is even uh, referred to many times as friend to the tax collectors and sinners. And that's in Matthew 11, verse 19. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, but wisdom is proved right by her deeds. Luke 7.34 has the same reference. The Son of Man came eating, drinking, and you say, Here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of the tax collectors and sinners. Now, I built all this up so we can get to the key verse we're going to be going with tonight, and that's in Luke chapter 19. So you see the pattern in here. I mean, I've read a lot of scriptures talking about tax collectors, and they reference them as being so bad. So now we get to the story in the account in, in Luke 19, verses 1 through 10, and you will recognize this as Zacchaeus, the tax collector. And most of you will find this very familiar. So Luke 19, beginning at verse 1, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. Chief tax collector, you'll note. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated any, anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said unto him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And there are several very, very important takeaways from this. And you can imagine the scene, if you've ever been to a, a, a big city parade or you've gone to a big city to watch an event like a marathon or something like that and you've seen the crowds that form along the sides of the road and how difficult it can be to actually see everything. And many of you may have memories of being a little child and your parents taking you to a parade or something and everybody's high and all you're looking at is a bunch of legs and you can't see anything, you're trying to get in there. So you can imagine the scene of people crowding in to see Jesus. And remember, at the time, the streets were narrower. If you've ever driven around Pennsylvania and going some of these back little back country roads into some of these little towns, suddenly the road narrows down and you're driving down through and the buildings are right up against it because at the time they were built, they were for horse and buggies. And if you go to any foreign countries, you see like some of the roads in Italy and some of these countries have been around and have had civilization there for thousands of years, you'll see that some of these streets are very narrow. And so you can imagine a crowd of people coming in and Jesus coming through this crowd. And they're even referred to in the uh, the King James Version, they say he could not see for the press. They call them the press, not like we call the press, 
the media, but the press of people, the people that were pressing against her. So you can imagine what it was like, people on both sides, him trying to see. And due to his lack of height, he didn't know what to do, he couldn't see over them. And it's interesting, and although he was a tax collector and thereby considered also a sinner, he obviously had a sincere heart and a desire to see Jesus. And I would say it is probably uh, reasonable to assume that there were other people at least close to his height, you know, short people, who may have come out. But it doesn't give an account of other people climbing a tree to see Jesus, right? I mean, we have Zacchaeus is the one who climbed a tree to see Jesus. So we see by this act that there's a sincerity in his heart. And it's later revealed by his repentance, which was obvious. I mean, there, the fact that he was willing to, you know, give back half of what he had and, and pay people back four times, that's, that's a, a lot to give away, even if you are wealthy. And so not only was he sincere, he became a believer. And imagine the fact that Jesus himself confirmed his salvation. He spoke those words to him. That's pretty powerful when you think about it. I mean, we don't have a lot of those accounts where Jesus actually confirms someone is being saved, so to speak. Now, a few years back, if you were here, I delivered a message about the Good Samaritan. And I am accused of having a different point of view on things than other people. Not in a bad way, but that I often see things from a different perspective. And we all know the story of the Good Samaritan, okay? You've heard this story many, many times. A man was traveling. He, traveling down a road, he fell among thieves. The thieves robbed him. They stripped him. They beat him. They left him for dead. Along came a Levi. He did not want anything to do with him, would not touch him. He went to the other side of the road. A priest came along, also went to the other side of the road, would not have anything to do with him. When Jesus told this parable to the Jews, he mentioned a good Samaritan. And it was very important to remember at the time that the Samaritans were hated by the Jews. They considered them to be well below them, both religiously and socially. And they were, they were, they were outcasts. But an outcast came and actually showed compassion on this man. This is, this is what he was trying to teach them who the neighbor is, that this man did this. Now, it's interesting because when I told you that story, I said, we like to identify as we're good Samaritans, right? That's what we always like to do. When you read a story like that, you always like to put yourself into the place of the hero. We're always the good, the good guy, right? No one wants to be the bad guy. Everybody wants to be the good one. We certainly don't want to see ourselves as the Levi or the priest who turned their backs on him. And I pointed out when I gave that message that we're wrong if we think of ourselves as the Samaritan because who we are actually are in that story symbolically is the man who fell among the thieves. We're the person who was stripped, beaten, left for dead, who could not help themselves. And it took someone else, someone who was an outcast and hated by the Jews, to come along and pick that man up, to pay the price. Does it sound like somebody? To pay the price for this man, and then to tell the innkeeper, I'm going away, but I will come back. And when I come back, I will pay everyone who has done anything good. I pointed out that the Good Samaritan is a symbol of Jesus in that story, and that we are the thieves. Nothing we could have done could have saved ourselves, and this, thief couldn't, or this, um, this person who was fell among the thieves could not save himself either. He was lost. He would have died had not the Samaritan come along. So I do things a little differently when I read parables, when I read accounts from the Bible. I just, that's my nature. I, I don't you know how to describe it other than that the Holy Spirit sometimes opens my eyes and makes me see things differently. In the case of Zacchaeus, he wasn't just a sinner. He was worse than that. He was the type of, G the, of a sinner that even Jesus had stereotyped in some of his references. And it's interesting because if I would ask you who you identify with in the story of, Z of Zacchaeus, you'd want to say, oh, we're like Zacchaeus. We really wanted to see Jesus, Right? But you've got to think about that. Zacchaeus was considered to be unreachable. He was considered to be someone trapped in a sinful lifestyle and that many Christians, or many believers at the time, would have given up on him. The fact of the matter is, we're missing a key element in this story. We're missing the crowd that was there. We're thinking of Zacchaeus and we're thinking about Jesus. But there was also the crowd. There was a crowd there that blocked Zacchaeus from seeing Jesus. They themselves wanted to see Jesus. They themselves may have been believers. 
but they never noticed Zacchaeus. They also stood in the way of Jesus so that Zacchaeus couldn't see them. And what's even worse is they turned their backs on Zacchaeus to see Jesus, never realizing that it was blocking his view. See, Zacchaeus represents so many of the people in our society that Christians, and I hate to say this, but Christians have turned their backs on. And if we turn our backs on them, who's going to look out for them? And these are the people that are considered, you know, unreachable. They might be drug addicts or, or convicts, you know, people maybe contemplating an abortion, homosexuals. You know, these are the people that we see as lost, and many Christians turn their backs on them and just figure they're a lost cause. And that crowd truly is a metaphor of what Christianity has become today, concerned more for themselves and more for what they're seeing than thinking about those people that are around them. I'm going to make some shocking statements here. Christianity is failing society. Now, don't get me wrong. Christ is not failing. Christ's message is not failing. But Christianity and what it has become, or what it has become known as, is failing society. And we have branches of Christianity now, different forms of Christianity. You know, the people are mel melding Christianity with politics and forming Christian nationalism and things. These things are not what Christianity is about. They're not what Jesus was about. They're not what Jesus' message was about. I said, Christianity is failing society. Jesus is not. Christianity has gotten in the way of Christ, just the same way that those people in that story got in the way of Jesus so that they couldn't, the person who was lost couldn't see. Christianity has gotten in the way because Christianity from the outside is not viewed as we think it is. A lot of people view Christianity uh, or see Christianity, they don't see Jesus Christ. When they look at Christians, they don't see Jesus Christ. They see hypocrisy or hatred or self-righteousness. That's what they view. And I've said this before, people love to say the media is trying to tear apart Christianity. Christianity is doing a great job tearing apart Christianity itself. Because unfortunately, every single person, just about every single person you can find, will know a Christian that they say isn't really a Christian, right? People always know someone that claimed to be a Christian, and they'll say, I know this person or that person, they're not Christian. So it's not the media tearing them down, it's that person themselves that have falsely represented Christ or improperly represented Christ. And so when these people appear to reject Christianity or reject Christ, they're rejecting a brand or a form of Christianity. They're not rejecting the message of Christ. They're rejecting Christianity because they don't see love, they don't see compassion. They don't see the peace, the joy, and the hope that comes only from the Holy Spirit and from knowing Jesus. What they do see, they do not want. They see people focused on their own agenda or a political affiliation or a candidate or their own selfishness, but they don't see Jesus Christ. And much of Christianity is no longer Christ-centered. It's more about being like a club, or like an organization, a group of people. Remember, it's supposed to be about Jesus Christ. Modern-day Christianity has become very much like the Pharisees of that age, unfortunately. They want nothing to do with anyone who doesn't fit their mold. They're more concerned with rules and agendas than they are with reaching the lost, showing Jesus and serving others. John the Baptist he recognized what his ministry was about, what his calling was about. It was not about himself. It was all about Jesus. In John 3.30, he said, He must become greater. I must become less. Simple statement, but very powerful. And remember, back in Luke chapter 7, verses 29 and 30, all the people, even the tax collectors, when they heard Jesus' words, acknowledged that God's way was right because they had been baptized by John, but the Pharisees and the experts of the law rejected God's purpose for them because they had not been baptized by John. It's really interesting and ironic that the very people who were considered to be the most religious of the day were the ones who completely missed the message of Jesus. You think about that. And unfortunately, 
Christianity today and some Christians are rejecting God's purpose for them. They'll stand up for a person who claims to be a Christian, shows no evidence by what they do, but they'll turn their back on somebody else who's seeking Christ. This shouldn't be. And they'll reject or mistreat people who are in need of the gospel purely because of a stereotype or a prejudice. It's no wonder that the non-believers really don't want anything to do with Christians or the way, because of the way Christians behave or Christianity. You know, there's a couple of good adages. You shouldn't buy hair tonic from a bald man. <laughs> you shouldn't take dieting advice from somebody who's morbidly obese. You shouldn't take financial advice from somebody who can't pay their own bills, right? And so why would the lost people want to take spiritual advice from somebody who's lacking joy, love, peace, all the attributes of Jesus in their own life? The past few years have been very, very difficult and very bad for Christianity in this country. There's been a lot of chaos and hatred. There's been sickness and death rioting and war, and now there's even the threat of war that people are worried about. And unfortunately, they've seen Christianity push agendas and candidates and doctrines and all sorts of other things, but they don't see them pushing Jesus the way they should be. Having Jesus out in front, having them turn to Jesus as their solution. We see more and more people walking away from the church, turning away from the church, we're called for something greater. We are called to be representatives for Jesus and ambassadors for Christ. You all know Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. You probably can quote that without even looking it up. Matthew 5, 16. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. And I ask a question, have you ever turned your back on a sinner? And by that, have you ignored a person's spiritual needs or their willingness just because you viewed them as a lost cause? Are there people who simply seem too far gone to be reached by the gospel? It was obvious in the account of Zacchaeus that not everyone who appears to be lost is a lost cause. If we look around we will see there's a lot of people searching and who are willing to accept the message of Christ. I had it happen this week when I talked to a young man from China. We see what happened with Zacchaeus. Most people would have written him off as lost. They, they must have assumed he was so entrenched in his sins and his way of life that there was no hope for him. And the religious people at that time certainly would have never believed it was possible for him to turn his life around anyway. And the funny thing was, all it took was an encounter with Jesus. He just needed to see Jesus. Now, I did not state the title of this message before I started. Natalie asked me before that, and I didn't, because I didn't want to give too much away. Because I entitled this, Get Out of the Way So They Can See Jesus. And I want you to think about that concept. How can we, as representatives for Jesus, or I guess you'd say ambassadors for Christ, how can we respond to what's happening around us? How can we be certain that we're not getting in the way of others and blocking Jesus? I mean, a couple questions you can ask. You know, is our personal testimony, I'm not talking about the daily testimony or the weekly testimony get up, I'm talking about when you see people in the street talking about your daily your testimony. Is your personal testimony all about Jesus Christ and what he's done for you, how he changed your life? Or is it more about you? and what you think you're doing for the kingdom. When given an opportunity to share Jesus with others, do we instead share unimportant things or even inappropriate things? Instead of sharing good news of the gospel, have we ever shared fake news? Are we more interested in sharing our doctrine and our own personal belief or our agendas, whether it be about politics or our denomination or otherwise, are we more interested about that than sharing the transformative power that comes with knowing Jesus Christ? Which matters most? When non-believers are those who we come in contact with on a daily basis look at us and our actions, do they see the fruit of the Spirit? 
manifested in our lives. And if you want to turn to Galatians 5, we'll go over them. Galatians 5, verses 22 through 26, talks about the fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, which is patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying one another. Not all unsaved people will automatically reject the teachings or the principles of Christ. More often, they do reject those who claim to come in the name of Christ, but who, re, re, excuse me, but who resemble Christ not at all. They have no resemblance whatsoever. They reject the message of someone like that because they see them as either hypocritical or judgmental or self-righteous. And all they see in that person are those things they do not see Jesus. So now, thinking about those gifts, in a society that's filled with, that is filled now with hate, we must let everyone see Jesus by showing his love. When people are filled with sorrow and despair, we must show the joy that comes from knowing Jesus. Amidst all this chaos and violence that we're experiencing, we must show peace that's not found in politics or in someone's bank account or in the number of guns that they own. We must let them see that the true peace comes from Jesus Christ, and it's peace not as the world gives it. At a time when everybody seems to have a bad attitude or a temper or a short fuse, and if you don't believe me, just go out and go driving around. We must allow them to see Jesus by witnessing our patience. Very short supply in this world right now. And now while there is an overabundance of selfishness, we need to show Jesus by showing our kindness our thoughtfulness, and our selflessness. In a world surrounded by some, or so much, I should say, of, that is bad and people are in need of witness, we need to show the goodness of Christ. We're meant to display this regularly so they can see Jesus. It seems you can't trust anyone anymore. So let people see they can trust in Jesus by the faithfulness they witness in our own lives. Where people are acting and reacting according to their most based emotions, and that's pretty much the way society is, we must show them gentleness and self-control in all that we do. And by so doing, we'll let them see Jesus in us. Because all that has taken place recently, people have been exposed to the hate, lies, violence, conspiracy theories, anything else that's man-made messes. This is a time more than ever that the lost need to see Jesus. And we cannot be concerned when we talk to the people we do that, that they agree with us or our personal doctrine or our personal belief. Because we do that, we get in the way. The most important thing is to show them Jesus. It should always be about showing them Jesus. Anything else, it's in the way and it's unimportant. We must never assume anyone is unreachable or too far gone. And unlike the crowds that blocked Zacchaeus, we need to be aware of those people around us and see if there's some way that we are blocking their view of Jesus. We need to be aware of those people like him who want to see Jesus, who need to see Jesus. And instead of standing in front of them, we need to kind of step aside, open our arms, allow them to stand beside us and point to Jesus. Say, there he is. As servants of Christ, we must be sure that when others look at us, they see Christ only. We must be certain not to block their view of Jesus by allowing ourselves to get in the way. We must always show them Jesus. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for providing us the account of Zacchaeus. We thank you for showing us that we should never stereotype anyone or see anyone as lost. Allow us to see them as you do and as Jesus did. Allow us to notice these people like Zacchaeus who are willing to go out of their way to see Jesus and help us to get out of their way and to allow them to see him. When others see us, let them see Jesus, not us. 
Let them see his love and all his attributes. Help us to manifest all the fruit of the Spirit in our lives and in all we do, and to share that fruit with others. Show us the things in our lives that are blocking the view of others and help us to tear those things down so that all they can see is Jesus. We love you. We praise you. We thank you and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.